Hi, my name is Arjun Bhattacharya. I'm a doctoral candidate in biostatistics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today I'll be presenting on multiomic strategies for transcriptome-wide prediction and association studies. I want to start off by giving a quick overview of transcriptome-wide association studies, or TWAS, by contrasting them with the classical genome-wide association study, or GWAS. In GWAS, we test the one-way association between millions of genetic variants with a single phenotype of interest, and this naturally leads to a steep multiple testing burden. Another issue with GWAS is that it commonly detects SNPs that are found in non-coding regions of the genome, and these results require considerable functional analysis to contextualize. In 2015 and 2016, TWAS was developed to expand on GWAS to address these issues. In TWAS, EQTL panels from relevant tissues are used to train predictive models of gene expression from SNPs that are in a local window around a gene. These models are used to impute expression in external GWAS cohorts that don't have access to transcriptomics. These imputed values represent the genetically regulated portion of gene expression and can be used to test for gene trait associations. As a result, TWAS dramatically reduces the number of tests from millions of SNPs to thousands of genes, and it also aids in interpretability by mapping genetic variants to testing units that represent single genes. In EQTL analysis, we often find highly significant trans-EQTLs, where the SNP and gene are far away from each other, potentially even on different chromosomes. For example, from some of our earlier work in detecting EQTLs in bulk breast tumors, we found clusters of trans-EQTLs. Some of these trans-EQTLs can be explained by cell type heterogeneity, such as those with HGH1, which is a gene that's highly expressed in immune cells compared to other cell types present in bulk tumors. Trans-EQTLs that are not spurious and are potentially mechanistically relevant may provide insight into gene regulation. In fact, several groups like Brandon Pierce's group at the University of Chicago, Frank Alberts at the University of Minnesota, and Leonid Kregliak at UCLA have shown that trans-EQTLs often huddle around regulatory elements. These observations are in line with the omnigenic model proposed by Jonathan Pritchard's group at Stanford. In it, they propose that gene networks are so interconnected that all genes in the transcriptome have some effect on complex phenotypes. Core genes directly affect the trait, while peripheral genes affect the core genes and thus have indirect effects on the phenotype. Moving backwards in the central dogma, the omnigenic model applies to SNP gene interactions as well. Local SNPs affect transcription of a gene through cis regulation, while distal SNPs have indirect effects on transcription through transacting pathways. In the most recent paper from Jonathan Pritchard's group about the omnigenic model, Distal SNPs were estimated to explain up to 70% of heritable gene expression. More recently, TWAS has started incorporating regulatory information into its predictive models. For example, the EPIC scan method from Panos Roussos' group at Mount Sinai showed that integrating epigenomic annotations into predictive cis-only TWAS models provides gains in prediction and TWAS power. Let me illustrate this method. Say we have SNP1 and SNP2 that are both local to gene G. Traditional TWAS, like PredictScan by Eric Amazon and Vanderbilt, or Fusion by Sasha Gusev at Dana-Farber, weights these two SNPs equally. Now, if I can tell you that SNP2 falls in a promoter or enhancer region for gene G, then EpicScan upweights SNP2 and downweights SNP1 in the predictive model. These kinds of annotations are useful and are generally available from large consortia or databases, but often are limited for understudied tissues and populations. So we set out to build on these lessons to use a data-driven approach to identify important distal genetic variants that are mediated through associated local biomarkers for incorporation into TWAS. We developed MOSTWAS, or multiomic strategies for TWAS. Today, I'm gonna to present some results here from simulations and real data applications in DCGA breast cancer and ROSMAP brain tissue multiomic data. The software for most was is available as an R package on GitHub. Here's a snapshot of the package down annotation online. Let's look at some of the biological mechanisms now uh, that most was leverages to train predictive models. Consider a gene G with its transcript level shown in blue. Far away, we have a SNP S in green that's found within a regulatory element of gene X. Accordingly, the SNP affects the transcription of gene X that codes for a transcription factor. 
Transcription factor X binds to the regulatory element of gene G and thus affects the transcription of gene G. If the association between the dosages at this stissel SNP S and the expression of gene G is strong, then we'll detect a distal EQTL between gene G and SNP S. Now, if the association is mechanistically true, then the SNP S has an indirect effect on gene G through transcription factor regulation. Accordingly, most wells can be used to detect similar distal regulation via differential chromatin or methylation state or microRNA binding. There are two methods for prediction in most wells. First, mediator enriched TWAS, which detects the strong association between the transcription factor X and the gene G and works backwards to the SNPs that are around gene X. A local predictive model for gene X is incorporated into the final model for gene G using two-step regression. Next, we have distal EQTL prioritization via mediation analysis, where we interrogate highly significant distal EQTLs, like the one shown here, to detect large indirect effects on gene G mediated through sets of biomarkers local to the distal SNP. Distal SNPs with large mediation effects are included into the final predictive model that we fit using elastic net regression or linear mixed modeling. Most of us selects the best model between these two methods as the final expression model for a given gene. Lastly, TWAS associations can be detected using GWAS summary statistics using the weighted burden test that Bakhtin Pasanayak proposed in the IMPG framework in 2014. Given a detected gene trait association in TWAS through the weighted burden test, we have to consider some follow-up tests. First, it's a natural concern to check whether a TWAS association is only significant because one or more variants in the interrogated locus have large effect sizes from the GWAS. Here we apply a permutation test, as implemented in fusion by Gustav and Null, that generates a null distribution by shuffling the gene SNP weights from the predictive model. Next, in MOSWAS, we developed a novel test to check whether a MOSWAS association is significant only because the local locus gives a strong association. We can think of this test as a group added last test from the regression, where we test the distal locus conditional on the association at the local locus. This is an extension of the IMPG framework and can be calculated adaptively from GWAS summary statistics. Under the null, the joint normality of the GWAS z-scores helps us calculate a distribution for this test statistic. We first conducted simulation analyses to compare most plus to local-only TWAS. Here we simulated a 400 sample reference EQTL panel with varied causal EQTL proportions as well as varied local and distal heritabilities on gene expression. Using these simulated EQTLs, we generated a continuous trait in a 1500 sample GWAS panel where the trait is generated entirely through these EQTLs and trait heritability is varied as well. We assessed predictive ability and TWAS power in these settings. Due to time, I've omitted these results, but in both simulations and real data applications, in and out sample predictive performance of most wells is considerably larger, approximately 1 to 2% additive increase in percent variance explained. We first conducted simulations where the distal expression heritability is equal in both the EQTL and GWAS panels. Here we found that especially at large distal expression heritability settings, most WAS has a significant advantage over local only models in terms of TWAS power. Next, we considered a setting where the distal EQTLs leverage in the EQTL panel do not exist in the GWAS panel or in other words, distal expression heritability is null in the GWAS panel. Here, once we achieve a large enough trait heritability, most WAS appears to capture the local-only model and performs marginally better than local-only modeling. In sum, most WAS outperforms local-only models if distal variation contributes to trait heritability, especially at low total trait heritabilities, and most of us captures a local only model when trait heritability is sufficiently large in GWAS panels where distal heritability does not affect the expression. We then turned our attention to conducting TWAS in real data scenarios. Using ROSMAP prefrontal cortex data, we trained expression models for 11 known risk loci for late onset Alzheimer's disease using most WAS. 
Using GWAS summary statistics from ICAP, we compare the TWAS strength of associations here with associations from local only models using PredictScan, shown in red, and TIGAR, shown in green, a Bayesian implementation from Jingjing Yang's group at Emory. To orient you to this plot, we have the 11 risk loci on the x axis, the negative log 10 p value for the raw strength of association from these three models on the y-axis, and the dotted line provides a cutoff for an FDR-adjusted p-value of 0 0.05. For many of these loci, we detected stronger associations in using the local-only models. Using most of us, 5 of the 11 loci met a false discovery rate adjusted significance of 0 0.05. None of these five loci were significant using the local-only models considered. Three of these loci persisted past the permutation test and the distal SNPs added last test. Notably, APOE, the gene that houses the strongest Alzheimer's risk SNP, shows significant distal variation that adds to the overall gene trait association, illustrating one of most WAS's advantages over local-only modeling. We were also interested in assessing how well most WAS associations replicate across cohorts. Using these same ROSMAP models, we conducted TWAS for major depressive disorder using summary statistics from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. We detected 102 genetic loci with significant associations with MDD risk that persisted past permutation. This plot here gives the TWAS associations from most WAS with Z scores on the Y axis and the genomic location of the interrogated genes on the X axis. The red dots show the significant loci at an FDR adjusted significance threshold of 0 0.05. For replication analysis, we downloaded genome wide association by proxy or GWAX summary statistics from the UK Biobank. In these GWAX summary statistics, seven of the 102 loci replicated. These loci are labeled on the plot. Now this is a slightly higher replication rate than what we saw using local only models, where none of the 12 loci from the PGC replicated in the UK Biobank summary statistics. Looking at the genes that replicated in these two cohorts, we recovered three known loci of genes that are relevant in neuropsychiatric disorders. SIT1 regulates synaptic transmission in the brain, CAC NA2 D3 is involved in calcium channel regulation and has been implicated in psychiatric disorders, and ADAT2 codes for an RNA editing protein that heightens the risk of neuropsychiatric disorders when it's dysregulated. An added advantage of MOSWAS is how it aids in functional hypothesis generation from gene trait associations. To set this concept up, using expression models trained with TCGA breast cancer data, we identified 11 genetic loci using summary statistics from ICOGS for breast cancer-specific survival that persisted past permutation testing. These 11 genes are enriched for common breast cancer pathways, like p53 binding and oxidoreductase activity. DNAL4 is one of the loci we found. It's a gene that's been recently shown to be downregulated in very aggressive breast cancer subtypes, like triple negative breast tumors. We also found two genes in the MAP-K pathway, a critical signaling cascade involved in activation and proliferation of many cancers. Now, using the distal SNPs added a last test, most WAS can aid in functional hypothesis generation. We applied this test to the 11 loci we found that are shown in red, and found that eight of them had significant contributions from the distal SNPs. When we looked at the mediators that were leveraged to include the distal SNPs in these models, we found a set of transcription factors that were all functionally integrated with the MAP-K pathway. For example, ROC2 belongs to the ROC pathway that interplays with the MAP-K pathway in proliferation and migration of tumor cells. Furthermore, knockdown of the transcription factor USF3 has been shown to upregulate MAP-K signaling in breast cancer cells. All in all, MOSBOS allows for more than simply mapping variants to genes that are close to it, like in traditional TWAS. It can also point to distal regulatory elements that may affect transcription of trait-associated genes and help functionalize some of these associations. To wrap up, MOSBOS is an intuitive approach to use multiomic panels to prioritize distal variants for TWAS. An advantage of MOSBOS is that its methodology 
allows remediator models trained in external datasets to be imported to enrich EQTL panels that don't have multiomic data. MOSFOS also gives improved transcriptomic prediction and TWAS power. We show that we recapitulate known associations that cannot be identified using local only models, and the distal SNPs added last test aids in functional hypothesis generation. An R package for most wasps is live online at GitHub at the given link with functions for model training, association testing, simulation framework, and file formatting. We're currently using MOSWAS in a series of TWAS in the placenta to identify potential networks of regulation that are relevant in developmental traits and disorders. That, that's a collaboration with Drs. Hudson Santos and Rebecca Fry at UNC Chapel Hill, who are a member of the Elgin study. Lastly, I'd like to thank my advisors, Mike Love from UNC Biostatistics and Melissa Troster at UNC Epidemiology, my collaborators, Hudson Santos and Rebecca Fry. Um, some fellow lab members who are letting me bounce ideas off of them, as well as Susan G. Komen, the NCI, NIH, and NIHS for funding my work. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.